difficult to give a climate change talk without showing slides. And so uh, this is a bit of an experiment. I should, I mean, I've, I've not done this before here at the church. And uh, perhaps the greatest challenge for me is not to fall down these stairs. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm not a climate scientist, so I cannot speak to the details and technical details about climate change. But I am a scientist, and I, I am a Unitarian. So what I can do is I can give you a Unitarian perspective of climate change. I can summarize the science, to the best of my ability, and kind of define the problem we're dealing with. And then the other thing I want to do is talk about a little bit about what we can do here at BUC and some of the initiatives that are taking place here. So those are the three things. I like to refer to them as the Unitarian Trinity. <laughs> <laughs> so let me get my remote here. Hopefully all the technical stuff will work. So the title of my talk is inspired by this uh, Native American proverb, uh, namely that uh, it was the earth was not given to you by your parents. It was actually loaned to you by your children. I found this to be particularly profound because in a sense that's what we've done in this little planet right here is we borrowed it from our children and now we want to think a little bit about what that means and what our responsibilities are for our children. Because our children are born in this world, they have no say in how, how the world is at the time they're born. It's our responsibility to make it right for them. And so as Unitarians, we can look at it from our own perspective. So we fly into our Unitarian church right here, we're all sitting here listening to this talk and now we're going to fly back out. This is really symbolic of the fact that whatever happens to the earth impacts all of us. And what we do as individuals impacts the earth. Because we're all connected together, we're all part of this web that makes up our planet. And so if we, in fact, are borrowing the earth from our children, climatologists will say that we're in danger of defaulting on our loan. And I think they have some good reasons to believe it. But unfortunately, this belief is not universally held. Last January, or last month, uh, the conference in Davos, Switzerland, was actually the top agenda item on that conference was climate change. All the world speakers came together and talked about the challenge of the things we need to do. And, but the, the views were divergent. In the case of our own president, in response to what the others were saying, and particularly to what Greta Thunberg was saying, was the following quote. To embrace the possibilities of tomorrow, we must reject the perennial prophets of doom. Prophets of doom, that's the key here. And their predictions of the apocalypse. They are the heirs of yesterday's foolish fortune telling. Okay. So in this perspective, climate change is not something real. It's something hypothetical that may or may not exist in the future. <coughs> it's looked at in the form of future tense and something that might otherwise focus too much on it might impact our prosperity and our growth, economic growth. On the opposite end of that viewpoint, we have the words of Desmond Tutu, widely regarded as a wise man, who five years ago said this, 25 years ago, people could be excused for not knowing much or doing much about climate change. Today, we have no excuse. So he's already looking at it in the past. We already know there's a problem. It's just that our re reaction to it is And so we have this back and forth. And that's why, unfortunately, the whole idea of a climate change will do has become a political debate, which is truly unfortunate because to give you one more quote, and that's from Susie Kassam, the Egyptian American, who said this, which I think is very relevant. When two brothers are busy fighting, an evil man can easily attack and rob their poor mother, in this case, Mother Earth. Mankind should always stay united, standing shoulder to shoulder, so evil can never cheat and divide it. So this is really a metaphor. She didn't write this because of climate change, but it's really symbolic of the fact that the sheer fact we're having the debate means we're not making progress. And this is what this quote is trying to say. And so the moral imperative that's required to do something about climate change is not universally held. It's something that we're gonna to have to develop for ourselves, for our own communities, and in this case, for our own church. So Unitarians are guided, morally guided, 
by the seven principles that we all know about. And then what you may know less about is the fact that we derive our spiritual growth from the so-called six sources. And the one principle and one source that's most relevant to climate change are the following. The seventh principle which says, respect the interdependent web of all existence, all of which are we are a part of. Whereas the sixth source is more spiritual. It says, spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. So in other words, our moral imperative as Unitarians is to love our mother, love our mother earth. Now, you've heard some fantastic music, very relevant music, subject at hand today. And it's interesting because this is the kind of musical, uh, this is the kind of music that actually played a really big role in the environmental movement in the 60s and 70s. You might remember, those of you of my generation, we had some huge problems with the environment back in the 60s and 70s with pollution. And uh, the environmental movement was very successful. It was a moral imperative where people stood shoulder to shoulder and that everybody accepted at least here in North America. And because of that, we were able to affect change. And a key, a key part of that was because we were able to change our culture, to undertake a cultural shift, and music played no small part in that. If you think about Neil Young's After the Gold Rush, that was all about post-apocalyptic Earth. If you think about the doors, when the music's over, that's all about the Earth moving unto it. And then you have the album cover from Moody Blues, A Question of Balance. And really, it truly is a question of balance. We have 100 million species around the world, encompassing trillions of living animals and plants, all adapted to the current conditions on the Earth in a fine-tuned process, a very fine and delicate balance, which if you, if you, if you change it too suddenly, if you change the environment too suddenly, even a small sudden change can have a negative impact on that balance. And being a scientist, I would like to talk about this balance in scientific terms just for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this may not sound like a scientific term, but the Goldilocks principle is what you might think. It's a scientist's way of borrowing from the fairy tale, saying uh, of the Goldilocks and three bears in which she tries three different bowls from three different bears and find that only one, just one, is the right temperature. The other ones are either too hot or too cold. So that's the way it's said in the fairy tale. Scientists like to be succinct, and the way they would say it is, something must fall within certain margins as opposed to reaching extremes. So our job, our task, is to figure out what those margins are and whether we're still within them or not. And from an evolutionary perspective, we can look at it following way, namely that life evolved on the earth by adapting to a specific type of environment. And because we adapted to that specific type of environment, that environment, by definition, has to be just right for us. So we are just right for the environment, essentially. If you, if you start changing the environment, that's bad news for us. So to put this in a more, a broader, more astronomical context, So the Earth sits third from the Sun, its neighbors are Venus and Mars. So we happen to be at just the right distance from the Sun for life to have flourished on our planet. Venus, a little bit too close, a little bit too hot. Mars, a little bit too far away, a little bit too cold. So we call this region that the Earth orbits around the Goldilocks zone. That's an astronomical term, actually. It's one that's used when we're searching for other planets around other stars. Are there planets within their stars? Goldilocks zone. So that's actually a technical term that's used. And there's a lesson to be learned here when we compare the climate histories of these three planets. If we look at the actual temperature on each planet right now, on Earth, if you take temperatures from all around the globe and average them over the course of a year, you come up with a single number, which is 58 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's above the freezing point of water and below the boiling point. Perfect for life. If you look at Mars, on the other hand, 
its average temperature is minus 81. Is there any chance we could turn these lights off as well? Or the ones over there? So uh, I get their punchline anyway. <laughs> so uh, if you look at Venus, 864 degrees. And yet, these planets are not that much further or closer to the sun than we are. So what's going on here? Why such extremes? <coughs> well, because climate, the way climate works, is, as exemplified with, with our neighboring planets, is once they're out of whack, it's a highly nonlinear process. And they can reach extremes very quickly. These are true extremes. I mean, Mars makes Antarctica look like a tropical paradise. And Venus is hotter than hell. <laughs> and I mean that literally. <laughs> I bet you didn't know this. <laughs> it has a temperature of 832 degrees. <laughs> Can you guess how we know? According to the Bible, hell is filled with what? Fire, Fire stone, sulfur, all those things, right? What's the boiling point of sulfur? <laughs> 832 degrees. <laughs> so Venus is hotter than hell. <laughs> if there's nothing else today, hopefully. <laughs> and therein lies the stark lesson for us. It's really not a laughing matter after all. This might tend to be a cheap laugh. Anyway, the point is, it doesn't take much to upset this balance. And Venus and Mars are true examples of that. It's a lesson to be had from our neighbors in the solar system. So our job is to figure out what's, what, it, what, what that little amount is. What's the tipping point? And the best way to do that is to gather the evidence and define the problem as clearly as we can. Because as the saying goes, problem well defined is 90% solved. Because then you know exactly what remedial action you need to take, as opposed to just guessing and shooting the dark. So what is the weight of the evidence? How well have we defined that problem? So here I'm going to show you an animation of global temperatures on the Earth, averaged over the past, uh, relatively average temperature over the past 140 years. And this is an animation that was uh, put together by climatologists who went through all the historical records of all the weather stations around the world, starting in about 1880, and getting to, and then uh, proceeding forward from there. So right now, every, mostly it's blue, a little bit of yellow, indicating that the, the planet was a little bit colder than average back then. And we progressed into the Industrial Age, and towards World War II, and beyond. We see that things are starting to change. There's less and less blue, a little more yellow, a lot more yellow, a lot more light. And look at what's happening in the Northern Hemisphere. A lot more red. Okay. So the point here is, and this is the way you would debate someone who will tell you, well, yeah, I happen to live where it's colder than it's ever been, right here. Not that anyone lives there. And, uh, and your argument should be, well, yeah, there it might be a little bit. It's all statistical, right? But on average, look at this. It's much, much warmer. In fact, North America and Asia are the worst because they don't have the modifying influence of the oceans to keep them from heating up even more. And so that's exhibit number one. I'm going to show you four exhibits that help define that problem. There's many more, of course, but these are the four I want to highlight. And so this is the comparison between 1880 and now, just to give you a more stark perspective on where we are. Another way to look at this problem is to see what's happening to the first snort of the rice cap. I'm not making it too depressed, but the story doesn't get better. And so what you have here is an animation over time and showing what's called the old ice, shown here in white. This is ice that never freezes in the summer, that doesn't melt in the summer. So it can survive year to year to year. That's why we have a permanent polar ice cap. And then the gray over here and down here, that's a seasonal ice. That's the ice that forms in the winter and disappears in the summer. And when you look at it, it kind of feels like a heartbeat. Have you ever seen an ultrasound of a heartbeat? It really is a heartbeat of, of a planet. And it's telling us a lot. And as we, as we track this over time, 
You see what's happening to the gold ice is it's breaking up into pieces, forming streamers, whereas before it was all one solid mass. And the problem with that is it wants warm water to get in between the uh, gold ice, pieces of the old ice. And that accelerates the melting of the old ice even more. And, and the end result is that you end up with two things happening, much less old ice and a, and a drastically smaller and polar ice cap. As you can see in this comparison between 1984 and 2016. Here's exhibit number three. And this actually shows you the magnitude of the temperature change. And again, there's some talking points embedded in here that uh, climate deniers, for example, will use. Uh, so here we have a plot of the Earth's temperature as a, another little details how we know this, but this is based on evidence that we have, it's pretty solid. We started recovering from, uh, from our last ice age about 20,000 years ago, and the temperature in the 10 years has been warming up ever since. So those who challenge climate change will tell you, well, this is just part of a natural cycle. We're just recovering from the ice age, that's all. Well, unfortunately, well, fortunately, that's only part of the story in terms of the argument. Because if you follow this curve, we, we recover from the ice age, and then about 8,000 years ago, we're fully recovered from the ice age. It's no longer a thing that we're dealing with anymore. This is the zoomed in view of the temperature spike I spoke about in the last slide. Um, if you take a closer look at it, you see it starts out in about 1850, and it goes up to the present day. And what these measurements show is that since about the early 1900s, there's been a steady increase in temperature as time goes on. And this temperature increase is exactly coincident with the start of the Industrial Revolution, and later on uh, with the addition of new uh, countries that have the, uh, begun developing industry of their own. Now this trend in the last few years has been fairly linear, and if you project it upwards on, and if we go all the way up to the year uh, 2100, we see that the temperature increase is going to be roughly about three degrees uh, C relative to what it should be. And this is actually a fairly critical number to look at. And the reason is that if we go back uh, to the previous slide and look at what was happening three degrees ago, you see that we were, we were in the middle of an ice age. So imagine what that means. You know, we were three degrees colder then, and uh, imagine now being three degrees warmer than normal. And so it's, in a sense, the opposite of an ice age, which uh, we can maybe call the heat age. And if you think about what the Earth was like uh, during the ice age, now imagine it's opposite. It's... Uh, it's a pretty stark prediction of a dark future. In summary, what Exhibit 4 is telling us is that we are violating the Goldilocks principle. As gloomy and depressing as this picture is, I am confident and hopeful that we can do something about it. In Leonard Cohen's song Anthem, there's a line that says, there are cracks in everything. That's how the light gets in. Hope is the same way, like this plant, it finds a crack through which it can grow. So what we have to do is channel our inner Goldilocks and demand that the earth be just right, and to do so with confidence because we have defined the climate change problem pretty well. It is therefore 90% solved. We know exactly what the problem is. We don't have to shoot in the dark to figure out what we're dealing with. Another reason to be confident is that we've done this before. How many of you have heard about Love Canal? The community in New, York, in New York State that had to be evacuated because it sat on a toxic waste dump? Or how about the blob? A large sphere of toxic chemicals sitting at the bottom of the St. Clair River, discovered by divers in 1985. Thanks to Dow Chemical, by the way. How many remember the year when Lake Erie was declared dead? 1970, that's right. How about burning rivers, smog, acid rain? You know what? We solved all those problems. The St. Clair River now hosts walleye tournaments and local restaurants are proud to serve fish from the Great Lakes. So we should celebrate our success and draw inspiration from it. The Cuyahoga River then and now.
Here's what would happen back then if you stuck a hand in the river. And here's the aftermath of the fire itself. And today, this has become a recreational river with verdant banks and abundant animal life. What a success story. In my generation, if you grew up in a major urban center in the U.S., the air would have irritated your eyes and lungs, and you would not have been able to see your own city skyline. That's shown here. Today, it's a totally different picture. Another success story, at least in North America. Our nation's proudest symbol, the bald eagle, became nearly extinct in the early 1970s. Why? Because of the pesticides of the pesticide DDT, among other factors. The map of Wisconsin, shown here on the left, shows how many occupied bald eagle nests there were in 1974. And the map on the right shows how many there are today. You can see the map on the right shows many, many, many more bald eagle nests that are currently occupied compared to 74. We saved the bald eagle from extinction. Yet another success story. So, with inspiration, with inspiration in hand, what can we do at the local level? What can we do at BUC? As many of you are aware, BUC has a climate change task force whose members are shown here. In fact, it was Jane O'Neill that invited me to speak today. That, the task force has created a, or drafted a resolution, which I will read to you. The resolution says, to increase nonpartisan political will within our congregation for, for legislation to put a fee in fossil fuels, that is carbon dioxide equivalents, to rapidly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So the areas in which you can think about getting plugged into and uh, becoming involved in are, include the following. Endorse the Energy Innovation Act as a con congregation. Energize ourselves. Vote yes on this resolution up here. Continue educational initiatives on climate change. Recommit to being a green sanctuary ministry. Recognize that it is a UU value to protect the earth. And of course, vote for the right representative. And let's not forget that it's the it's the marginalized community is always getting impacted the most in these kind of situations, and the climate change is no exception. I would like to close by paraphrasing Timothy Leary. Remember him? Turn on, tune in, but for Earth's sake, do not drop out.